Hey, this is actor and disability inclusion advocate, Angel Jafria. And if you want to build an abundant and meaningful life you're proud of, you should be listening to My Voice, Our Story with my friend Cielo. Do you want to create an abundant and meaningful life you're proud of, but don't know where to start? You're in the right place. Welcome to the My Voice or Story podcast. My name is Cielo. I'm a former TV journalist turned entrepreneur in a quest to build an extraordinary life. I believe that success is a direct reflection of our daily routine and choices. So join me as I engage in unfiltered conversations with the most influential minds of our generation to learn their secrets to a thriving life. If you want tangible tips on how to cultivate habits that will transform your life spiritually, financially, and emotionally, you got to keep listening in. So let's get started. Hello, guys. Welcome back to my new episode of the My Voice Our Story podcast. This is your girl, Cielo. Hello, guys. If this is your first time with us, welcome. Thank you for tuning in. My Voice Our Story is a community, and we are here for your evolution and growth. Today, I have a really awesome guest on the show. Her name is Angel Jeffria. She is an actor, model, public speaker, and disability representation advocate who was born missing the lower half of her left arm. She wears a high-tech bionic hand and has affectionately been coined the bionic actress. You can see her in Chicago Med, FBI Must Wanted, Impulse, and most recently the season two finale of Snowpiercer. Two things Angel will say have always been part of her life are acting and disability advocacy. So, she's going to tell us about her experience in Hollywood as an actress with a disability, and most importantly, she's here to share her wisdom on how you can turn your disadvantage or weakness into your biggest strength. But before we begin, really quickly, if you're an entrepreneur with a six-figure business or more and you want to increase your digital presence to take your business to the next level, we are here to help you. Blunty W, the media company that produces My Voice or Story, provides SEO, SEO stands for Search Engine Optimization, content strategy services that can help you improve your rankings in Google within six months. So if you want to escalate your business and get more clients, this is for you. Just send us an email at outreach at blendyw.com to book a free consultation today. Now back to the show. Let's get started. Hi, hi, hi. Welcome, Angel, to the show. Hi, how are you today? I'm excited that you're here with us today. Yeah, I'm super excited to talk to you about a lot of fun stuff. Yay. So do you want to introduce yourself briefly to our audience for anyone that might not be familiar with your work? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, my name is Angel Jafria. I am an actress who also happens to have a limb difference. I was born missing the lower half of my left arm. And I'm also commonly known as the bionic actress because I do wear a really cool prosthesis um, that's been featured in a lot of the projects I've worked on from different commercials to films. So that's pretty exciting. And yeah, I also do a lot of public speaking and talk about disability advocacy and things like that. Yes, that's very important, that advocacy work. So at five months, you started wearing a myoelectric hand. Is that, is that correct? You were f- yeah, well, a, a little younger than that. I was okay. four months, 10 days. And I only say that because it, you know, set a world record. <laughs> <laughs> Um, So when was the first time that you realized you had a disability or, you know, because you were very young? Right. It's actually really funny because disability was such a weird word for me growing up. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that not knowing anybody else who was disabled or who had a limb difference, I didn't identify with that word. You know, I just constantly heard these people, you know, wanting to give me praise by saying, oh, I don't consider you disabled. So when someone says they don't consider you something, you think like, oh, that word must be a not a good thing. Mm -hmm. So I remember realizing I was different when I used to be able to kind of take off my arm and and throw, you think like babies throw their bottles when they want attention. Yeah. I would take off my arm in like the middle of a restaurant and like throw (sighs) it. And my mom would be like, oh no, not again. Um, And then someone would bring it back and they'd be like, oh, she's so cute kind of thing. And I started to realize like, oh, other people can't do this. And I thought I had, like, an advantage. I thought this was, yeah. like, a cool thing about me. I never realized until probably I was probably, like, six or seven in, like, first grade. And 
you start getting like the teasing mm. where it's like, you know, the one handed girl. And I'm like, well, yeah, I have one hand. And then I was like, oh, they're saying it in a negative way. <laughs> um, so, you know, I was I was probably around that age when I realized like my physical difference was something that people didn't look at as co- as cool as I thought it was. Um, But the word disability is really interesting because I only really started identifying with that once I was in college and realized that, you know, disability wasn't a bad word. And I started becoming more connected with other people who had limb differences and other disabled people and realizing like, oh, I have a community. I have a group of protections with like the Americans with Disabilities Act. Mm -hmm. I have all these things that people fought for to make it so that I can exist in this world in a way and like disability is not a bad word. It's just people have been using it wrong. Um, Yeah. Like to be honest, like even until now, like I only, like I said, it's like the correct term to use, but I don't like it either. (laughs) But some people don't like the word different too. Cause I've used different before. It's like, what do you mean I'm different? I'm like, okay. So yeah. (laughs) Yeah. It definitely becomes a thing of preference of like, Um, So I'm a camp counselor also at an amputee youth camp. So with kids who have limb differences and kids who are relatively new amputees as well. It's interesting to hear the kids change over the years from what they want to be called because, you know, you hear differently abled and sometimes people think of that as patronizing. They're like, what different abilities do I have? Like, I don't see through walls. I'm not like, you know, but at the same time, sometimes people don't feel comfortable with disability. So it's kind of just, a smart move to ask someone how they're just like you would with someone's pronouns, like how they're comfortable identifying because whether they're a new amputee or a new person with a disability that may not be be comfortable that way, or, you know, they just have a word that they prefer. And I think that's kind of the way that we should go is making sure that we just, you know, have everybody that's around us comfortable and, and happy. And that's how we become the most productive. Yeah. That's the smart way to do it. Absolutely. And just be respectful too, I think. Yeah, absolutely. So how did you get into film? Like, tell me your story. <laughs> it's actually pretty, pretty funny. Uh, I have a master's in psychology. Um, <laughs> okay. So, wow. So which, you went to college and you studied psychology. <laughs> what, what was your bachelor's degree? Uh, psychology as well. So I had a, I majored in psychology, but I minored in biology and criminal justice. I had a whole different plan. Um, but I started acting at a relatively young age. Like I said, I liked attention, right? I'd throw my arm in the stores and things. Um, and having a, an apparent disability or like something people, you become this teacher. And I loved that. I, I, some people don't, I know tons of people who are like, well, I'm tired of people asking me questions, but for me, it was fun. You know, I got to stand up there and I got, I knew everything about the topic. I knew about my prosthesis. I knew about my limb difference. So I could kind of just explain to people and I got to, got the stage for a minute. Right. Um, and I loved that. So I went into community theater when I was probably like nine, um, our young actors program and did that throughout, um, eighth grade. And then I got to high school. My high school didn't have a drama program, but I did things like mock trial, which I really, really enjoyed, which is similar to acting, right? You get assigned a person, you're the witness, you're the judge, you're that you have a character to play. Um, And I also fell in love with psychology and criminal justice at the time. I never saw anybody that looked like me on TV, right? We can't think of really any actual actresses that are out there in a recurring show, at least right at this moment, there are some coming up that I'll talk about later, um, that have a limb difference. So I loved acting, but it never seemed like, oh, this is the job. This is the career. This is the life path. I always thought that I would do it for fun for the rest of my life, but I never thought that I could, you know, make this my my life's work. Um, so I went into psychology, got my bachelor's, worked really hard, uh, started my master's, got all the way through my coursework, only had my thesis left. And I had been in acting classes pretty consistently outside of the university. i done a lot of film and television classes. I got an agent. Um, And during that time, I had gotten my newer prosthesis that was really cool looking. Yeah, right. Oh, cool. I'm like, whoa, I was looking at it. Yeah. (laughs) But I had gotten this newer arm that a lot of people were interested in. And I was one of the very few people in the U.S. who was wearing it. Um, So it went from, you know, all of a sudden I had casting directors and and people reaching out to me saying, you know, we think your arm's really cool. Also, we saw your resume, like you've done a lot of work. Like, would you like to audition for this project? So I had an agent and I started booking things, you know, not huge things, but, you know, a, a co-star role here in The Accountant or 
a commercial role here. Um, I did a Super Bowl commercial, which was really cool, you know, an Apple commercial. And it was like, oh, these are all cool things. Um, and my thesis advisor was like, Angel, maybe you should just, you know, leave the program and do acting. And I was like, no, no, I'm going to do both. So, of course, I stretched it out. It took me forever to finish my thesis because I started realizing, like, maybe acting is the job. Maybe, you know, maybe psychology, I do love psychology and I'll always pay attention to that side of it. But if I can be an actress as my profession, like it started to feel like there was, this was something I couldn't not do. Do you know what I mean? You're like, I can't not do this anymore. I thought about like, if I had to leave psychology or leave acting and I was like, I can't not act. So maybe that should be my goal. Um, And I, I just fell in love with it. I started working more and more. I started auditioning more and more, um, getting different parts. I, I got to, I was the lead in a horror film that we shot in Australia, which was really cool. A, a lot of fun. Yeah. <laughs> um, definitely, definitely shot a horror film. You forget when you read the script, how cool it is. You're like, wow, this is so cool and gritty. And you're like, oh, I have to do, oh, me. I have to, <laughs> I have to get kidnapped and all this bad stuff has to happen to me. Oh, <laughs> you forget that sometimes. <laughs> but yeah, it's definitely been a journey, like a whole like arc of where I'm at and what I'm doing. But I still love psychology. And when casting directors will see it on my resume, they're like, oh, you have a master's in psychology? Because they're similar, right? Understanding why people do what they do no judgment. People just are who they are. And that's like what you do with characters. You can't judge them. You just know this is a person who exists. And you need to kind of dissect the character. So I think like having a psychology background really helps you because that's what they do. They're like trying to understand the other person, right? Like my therapist is like, it's a really tough job what we do. And I'm like, I'm sure. (laughs) (laughs) You just like break it. You have to break like when you get so little about a person and then you have to make these decisions. And I think psychology helps with that because sometimes you're going, why would they do this? Why would you're like, but she seems so nice. Why did she do this? And you kind of have to come up with, well, this is why what we think a nice person, it's like the idea that they're it's not bad people, bad decisions. Like, yes, there are, I guess you could say bad people, but like a lot of times it's just someone making a bad decision or, you know, making a decision with them with the information that they have or things like that. So it, it's like, I think the psych aspect of it really does help you leave the judgment at the door because, you know, people come in and they talk to you about things within psychology where you're going like they're a human that wants to do better, you know, and that's what you have to accept whether no matter what they did wrong before this kind of thing. Um, so yeah, it's, it's fun. I think the character work is definitely one of the really fun parts. Okay. Awesome. So, um, are there any more actresses in like Hollywood with like a limb difference? Have you seen many of them? Yeah. So it's, it's actually really interesting because like when I started out, there wasn't really anyone like me. Right. And through the years, like I, you know, when you think about what you see on TV, right. You see, uh, teenagers are typically played by people who are in their twenties and things like that because of, Truthfully, it's because of labor laws. A lot of times people think, they're like, why would they do that? It's like, because if they have someone under 18 on set, they have to have teachers and all those things like that. Mm, and they can okay. only work four hours at a time. So typically you hire someone over 18 to play kids. So I was auditioning for 14 year olds for years. Wow. And then all like, but there were never any parts for young disabled people or young people with limb differences. And I even had a pretty big show runner of a show that's still on. Um, say to a casting director one time, oh, I really liked her audition and she's really great, but, you know, let her know that there's just no cute amputees on this show. Um, He's like, they, he's like, when she gets older, she'll play more, you know, like the gritty roles. And it was the idea that like to be an amputee on TV or being someone missing a limb on TV, you had to play the veteran, the athlete, you know, the uh, some an unhoused person. Like they, these were the roles that we got, you know, and you don't see kids in those because those are sad. But it's actually changed a lot over the years. We started to see a lot more um, typically guys, but like Kurt Yeager, he's amazing, a super talented actor, and he's a lay mm-hmm. amputee, and he's been working a ton. Um, um, my friend, Eric Grace, who's a bilateral amputee, uh, he's missing both of his legs. He's fabulous. Um, he was on a show recently called Teenage Bounty Hunters that they canceled. And I'm just so upset about it because it was so good, <laughs> but he's also on Lock and Key, which is another show. Um, and then it's when it comes to women, it's really cool because, uh, there's several shows coming out this fall that have teenage girls as lead characters oh, that have wow. their differences. 
That's yeah, amazing. which, you know, me, I'm like, dang, I missed the, I was here and they were there yeah. and we like, you know, but I'm so glad to see that teenage girls now can have representation of themselves. They can see characters like them. So there's Autumn Best, who's going to be on a show called The 4400, which is a remake, and she wow. has an upper limb difference. Um, she's missing part of her hand. And then there is Zara Gorlecki, who is going to be on a show called La Brea, which is funny because I auditioned for all of these, but obviously I'm not playing 15 anymore. Yeah. But <laughs> Although you could. You look very young. Yeah. I still get the audition, so they must think that maybe. But, you know, I do think it's smart to go clo- as close as you can to the age, especially if you want the show to to, to last for a long time and, you know, re- realistic. Um, Autumn is 18. I think Zara is 18. So, you know, if they're playing 16, 15-year-olds, it's closer. Um, but Zara's amazing. She's a leg amputee. I'm pretty sure she lost her leg to cancer. Um, oh, wow. But it was definitely an acquired amputation, not a congenital limb difference. Um, who else is there's, there's a couple different people and it's just been really exciting. Like every casting that I've gotten that says like casting a 15 year old girl, we are authentically casting this. They have to be an amputee or be an actress with a disability. And that's just so refreshing to see because it used to be where they would be like, we're trying to cast this authentically, but if we can't find it, you know, and I think yeah. like Moana and a lot of those films really like Disney, obviously Pixar, they have the ability to do it, but they really led the way in saying, we are going to find this person. Mm. They exist. You know, we want, um, with like Moana, we want like make sure, make sure this is someone who's indigenous that can sing and do this. And we want the right age. And when these big companies set the example of saying like, you should be finding the right person. It really helps because, like, I'm a huge fan of Mad Max and Furiosa. Charlize Theron played um, a character who has a limb difference. It was, like, six years ago. And I love the character. She she plays, like, they green-screened out her arm the whole movie. But oh, the wow. character's so cool. No one asks her what happened to her arm. No one asks her if yeah. she's okay. No one asks her if she can do things. And I just thought that was so great to see a limb-different character like that. But then you think about the fact of what that's actually doing for representation. Is anyone watching the movie, because everyone knows who Charlize Theron is, right? Yeah. Is anyone watching the movie going, wow, it's so cool to find out and to know that a person missing an arm can do this, 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 this. Mm. They don't think that. They think it's so cool to see Charlize Theron doing that with a green screen sleeve. Yeah. Right? So what is it really doing for representation? So, like, if you want to actually have people see these things and believe in these people, whether they're amputees, whether they're wheelchair users, whether they're someone who's deaf or blind, it's, you need to see the real people doing it because people don't believe it. Otherwise they go, they see, they see blind people all the time. I have a friend who's blind, who's always on his phone. Like he's not totally blind, but he's legally blind. He uses a white cane and everything, but he can zoom in on his phone. He uses all the accessibility features, which is amazing. He works with Apple. But you'll always see these viral photos of, is this person really blind? Because they're holding their phone. And it's like all these accessibility features exist for these blind people to use. And it's like, if you just had a blind character on TV using their phone and showing what they do, one episode, people wouldn't look at those photos anymore and go, oh, that's a fake blind person. They understand that that's a thing that happens and exists. So... I'm really excited to see all the representation that's coming out later this year and to see what that does for just people with limb differences and amputees existing in the world and public. Like, I won't hear people asking as many questions about my arm because they'll know. They'll know. Because they'll have seen it on TV. Like, that's a cool thought. Like, I could just be. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. So it's slowly changing, right, you would say? Slowly changing, getting better. It was slow for a while, and then I think in the last five years, it's definitely three, three definitely, last three years for sure, it just kind of shot up where they were like, you know, we're doing this. This is definitely happening. Um, We we have to cast authentically. Like, there was, you know, the Oscar So White push where they pointed out the fact that they did not have a lot of diversity within the lineup, but disability was always left off of those conversations. Yeah. And everyone was kind of like, hey, like, Right here. Yesterday. Like, yeah. Yesterday was the 31st anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And everyone always like wants to talk about it, but it's like, it's not utilized as much as people think it is. It's not, 
it's not as easy to claim, oh, you've gone against the ADA. Like they just said this year, I think it was at the Oscars, right? It was the first year because Crip Camp was nominated that they had a ramp on the stage. Oh, wow. But in, in announcing that this was the first year they've ever had a ramp on the stage, they outed themselves as going against the ADA for the last however many 30 years because you're required legally to have a ramp on the stage. Oh. So, like, it's, like, great you had a ramp, but you were shirking the rules before this. <laughs> like, like, we're glad you had one this year, but, like, you kind of were supposed to. Wow. Um, so it's just been that thought process where everyone kind of, like I said before, like, with casting, they'd say, oh, you know, we're going to look for a different person, but if we can't find someone, yeah. we'll green screen. And now they've kind of been, like, that's not flying anymore. Like we want to make sure we're doing this right. And I really respect the productions and like, I'm telling you the CW 4,400, the one that cast autumn, like they have done so much great, inclusive, diverse, just casting in, in their show. And I can't wait to watch it. Like I was like, Oh, I wish it was me. Obviously it's like, I did, wasn't right for the role. You want you always want to be the right one for it. And sometimes you're just not. But I'm really excited to see the inclusion and how they write these shows around these really diverse characters. Yeah, it's about time to, like, seriously. <laughs> That's a great point. <laughs> what is, like, the biggest misconception do you think that society has about people with disability? It's really interesting because I think from my psychology background, right, I, I did my thesis on stigma and the idea that people have these thoughts about people without even maybe realizing it. Like you have this like bias that you maybe just grew up with from TV, from movies, from whatever, from the representation you've seen. And one of the biggest things that I found is that people, non-disabled people, mm. consistently think that disabled people are sad. They don't like their life they're angry, they want to change things. And I feel like that's not the case. That mm -hmm. that is believed because that's the representation you've seen mostly on television, mm -hmm. right? They always want to show you the angry veteran, which is not always like not the case. Yeah. Most veterans mm -hmm. I know are super amazing, brave, inspirational people that like kick butt. Yeah. But they I've played a lot of angry veterans. I'm not a veteran, like on different TV shows. And it's just this general idea that I think the misconception is, is that we don't like our lives. Mm. And I think, you know, obviously everybody has their bad days, whether it's, you know, literally anything about your body. Um, but, and then, you know, people who do have pain associated with their disability, like obviously they would prefer to not have pain, Yeah. but it doesn't mean that, you know, we hate ourselves because we have a disability. It's like, we still get up every day. We do these things. And a lot of times when people call people inspirational, it's a really interesting thought for me because I don't know if you've seen, I posted a, a reel on Instagram about inspiration and it's a really interesting thing because when people tell me I'm inspirational, I always want to just, just like, I, I appreciate it. I think it's very kind, but a lot of times I wonder like what I did, like, what did I inspire you to do? And when they feel they, they, you want to tell somebody that they inspired you. And I think that's an important part of it. If you think, and you look at somebody with a disability and you're like, Wow they're super inspirational. What does that mean to you? What did they mm. inspire you to do? Is it, did you go, wow, this world wasn't designed for how their body looks functions and they're still out there doing the things that they need to do. And you know what? Maybe I'm taking my body for granted. Maybe I'm like, that's cool. And that's great. Now necessarily to like, when you say like you're inspirational, like, do I, you're like, I just don't want to take my body for granted anymore. Sometimes it's like, oh, I didn't need to hear it, but I'm glad you, you had that thought process and that realization because that makes us so much closer together as people with disabilities and people who don't have disabilities yeah. of you realizing like, maybe this world was designed to make my life easier, but yeah. not their life easier. Yeah. Um, and that's an interesting thought process about it. But I think we just live our lives. People with disabilities get up. They do things. We do things. When someone tells me I'm inspirational for, you know, going grocery shopping, I want to be like, like, you're also inspirational for being at, you know, this grocery shop at eight, grocery store at 8 p.m. Like, it's, we, none of us want to be here. Like, yeah, like super early. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But it's, it's one of those things where, like, I think the idea of just having the conversation with yourself and when we want to talk about inspiration, I'm like, what does that mean to me? Yeah. What, what did I get inspired to do? What changes about my thought process in thinking this? in saying this, because that's where all the change comes from. 
that's where all the the real meat of what we're the discussion is is you having to analyze what that meant to you absolutely and i think that's the important conversation that people kind of gloss over when they just want to go wow it's really cool that you're doing that that's what a lot of times that's what they mean yeah like are they they necessarily inspired they've never seen a one-handed person juggle a gallon of milk and 14 other things and use a robot arm like you can also just say, hey, that's really cool. Like, that's fine, too. Like, <laughs> I don't need to be inspirational all the time. I can just be cool sometimes. <laughs> I think I think most of the times that I'm going to be super honest, um, I feel is that you complain about daily things in your life, you know, and, and then you see someone that has a disability and they're just like, oh, my God, like you like so positive. And then they're doing so many other things like and you take it for granted, basically. And you don't understand how blessed you are. And, you know, like I've noticed a lot of the times that's what happens. Um, mm-hmm. So that might be one way why they would say you're inspirational. You feel that way. It feels yeah. like, what am I doing with my life? Like, Yeah, it's actually a really interesting concept. They There's there's the conversation of what's something called inspiration. Um, they're trying to change it. But like it, it was originally word, worded as inspiration porn, which is not, you know, We don't love that phrasing, but it's the idea that like a lot of times you'll see commercials or things like that, that just include people with disabilities with the idea of inspiring non-disabled people, which we don't technically love because like that isn't why we exist. Mm -hmm. Like when I am doing something cool, like I understand that someone is inspired by it, but at the same time, like I am just doing the thing in the way that I know how to do it. Yeah. And especially people who've always done it that way, someone who was born that way. Yeah. And then, like like you said, like, we all have things. Like, you only know your own struggles. Yeah. So, like, when you are going, oh, wow, if I was missing my arm, my going to the grocery store would be much more difficult. Pushing a shopping basket, doing all these things. Having that realization is very important because it makes you realize um, the social model of disability. Like, my body isn't disabled. I'm disabled by the world that was built around me, yeah. not for my body. Love right? that. Yeah. Right? Like, it's not that my body's wrong. It's that everything that was built was built for four-limbed people who walk upright. Like, that's that's what the world was designed for. Yeah. And when you think about the things that I have trouble with, it's because it wasn't made for me. Absolutely. Like, you know, same thing with wheelchair users. When you think about the things that they have trouble with, stairs weren't made for them. Like, yeah. <laughs> like it's it's things like that. And it's like, my body is my body. And it's not necessarily the problem in this situation. Yeah. The problem is this thing in front of me and how I need to figure it out. So, like, I always say disabled people have, like, resume-worthy problem-solving skills. Because literally every situation you're going into probably wasn't designed for you. Whether it's just filling up a cup at a water cooler, right? You think, like, most people with two hands would walk up, put the cup down, push the yeah. thing. And, like, me, I'm like, okay, well, I can't feel my hand. Am I going to crush the cup? Am I going to do the thing? And we, without even having to really go, oh, how? We do it, right? We go, okay, well, maybe if I do this, 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 and this, I've accomplished the task in the way that I need to. Um, which I think is... If we are talking about when we say differently abled or whatever capabilities, I'm like, okay, problem solving and reading a room. I feel like that's the two superpowers of most people with disabilities (laughs) that we can tell how to make people comfortable. We, I mean, from being a kid with a disability, especially one that's so apparent or having a limb difference, like you walk in and you go, especially with adults, how do I make them realize I'm okay? Because mm. I know I'm okay. Yeah. But they're worried because they maybe don't know any kids with disabilities or haven't yeah. seen any kids with disabilities do things or exist or be happy and fun loving kids. So like even as a kid, I would walk in and be like, Oh no, I'm fine. I'm good. Like, yeah, I got a robot arm. It's cool, huh? Like and like I still do it nowadays. Like I'll have kids come up to me and be like, Oh, I'm sorry. And I'm like, Don't be sorry, it's fun. It's like Iron Man. Like I can I can use Iron Man as my representation. I could use, you know, Nemo from Finding Nemo. I'm like, you know, Nemo, he has a little a lucky fin. Like I have a little um. fin like that. Like So having that representation, I think, even within like animated movies and superhero movies has been really, really helpful in even just explaining to kids. And I think parents have changed a lot too. Yeah. It used to be back in the day, a kid, I'd be standing in line at a grocery store and I would hear, like, mom, what's on her arm? And the mom would be like, shh, shh, like, like <laughs> shushing them. And like, I get it. They're worried about, you know, maybe I'll be upset, maybe, but, or maybe they just weren't ready to have the conversation, right? Mm-hmm. So, but what they just did by shushing their kid 
is make their kid go every time they see somebody with a disability, don't look, don't stare, shh, everyone quiet, you know, right? This is something bad, right? Mm. You just, something we don't talk about. Uh, versus the first time I remember this happened, a mom literally said, um, I'm not sure. I think it's uh, a prosthetic arm, but, you know, some people just look different and that's how it works. Wow. And the kid went, okay, because they're your kids and they listen to what you say, you yeah. know? <laughs> like, and it was this easy as saying people look different sometimes. Yeah. What has been the hardest thing of, like, living with a lip difference? <sighs> I think a lot of the issues that I have right now uh, are around um, getting prosthetic devices. Mm. I think we are not structured very well with insurance. My parents had to fight my entire life with insurance companies to get my arms. And it's, it's interesting because like there are tons of kids with upper limb differences who didn't want them, who didn't like them or just weren't able to get them. Mm -hmm. Um, you'll hear people every day to my friends who don't wear prosthetic devices. You should get one of those robot arms. And like the thing that sucks about that is sometimes they've been trying for years and insurance companies have said, like, no, people think, oh, I have health insurance. A lot of people, if, if you're not an amputee, check your health insurance policy right now and check what kind of device you would get if you lost a limb. Because a lot of times these policies will say, like, oh, we'll cover a hook, but we won't cover a myoelectric. Wow. We'll cover, you know, um, a stationary ankle, but we won't cover a mi microprocessor knee. Mm. And people aren't paying attention to those things because they don't think it'll be them. Yeah. Right. And, and that's been my recent fight has been really frustrating of trying to get devices approved. Um, that's very fresh on my mind just because it's just been a frustrating thing going back and forth with my prosthetist who wants to help me get what's best for me in yeah. my life. And when we have insurance companies who are businesses fighting yeah. back about what yeah. they think is best for me, you know, yeah. It sucks because I feel that it's the U.S. We're so advanced. We're a developed country. And yet so many people don't have access to just basic needs. And we have the technology. We absolutely have. But it's a business in this country. <laughs> it's always it's been. It's a business. That's the way That's like the way that I try to explain it to people. Because people, the main denial that people get for prosthetic devices is the phrasing, not medically necessary. Oh, gosh. And I just, and it's really hard to understand when a two-handed person is telling me that the prosthesis that I want that is the closest thing to a second hand is not medically necessary. They're like, we're only met required to give you the closest, you know, thing, which to them is a body powered hook, which body powered hooks are cool devices. I know mm -hmm. people who that's their, what they want to wear. They're waterproof. They are pretty receptive to your body, but it is your shoulder doing the movement. You're literally pulling back your shoulder like this to mm -hmm. open and close the hand. So depending on the person, like I, my really good friend, John, he wears two, he's missing both of his arms. And like, he's a very rough and tumble guy, right? This is like carrying around an iPhone in your hand, all, like on in your hand all day. So like think of the tasks you wouldn't do holding an iPhone. Um, oh, yeah. But for me, for my life, this is the best device for me for tying my shoes, for getting ready in the morning, for going to work, for going on auditions, for seeing kids every day, for hanging out with people. This is the best device for me. For him, working under his car and out in the yard and the, doing that, you wouldn't be holding your iPhone. Mm -hmm. So it's just the frustrating thing that insurance companies go, well, he's good with it. They're like, why, why do you need the fancy arm? Oh, I love when they, one day they called it the bells and whistles arm in front of me. Wow. I was like, listen, sir, your hand is the bells and whistles hand. Like yeah. your fleshy, you know, doesn't need to be charged, is waterproof, like doesn't need to go to the shop for repairs, heals itself. Hand is the bells and whistles. Yeah. I was like, my hand's not waterproof. I have to send it back to repairs and get loaner hands occasionally. Like I have to charge it every night. Like I can see like how much charge I have left. It, like there's different things like that, which sound cool. Like they are cool and yeah. it's much cooler than it was and more high tech than it was when I was a kid. But it's not this. It's still a tool. It's yeah. not a hand. And that's what I try to explain to people. It's like you're telling me that the closest tool that works the best for me is not medically necessary. So it's an interesting struggle. And with the advent of 3D printed prosthetics coming out, um, there was a lot of exciting things um, that happened really fast where people thought 3D printing is going to be the future for sure. 
But then the problem with that became the materials used in 3D printing are very, mostly very weak and not very durable. And if you think if your hand is breaking every time you try to do an activity, how often are you going to use it? Yeah. So now there's two companies that in the U.S., one is FDA approved and, and actually covered by insurance right now. It's the Hero Arm out of the U.K. And there's another one called True Limb um, for East and La Chapelle. They're both 3D printed devices that are meeting the durability standards or are starting to. But it is definitely and because they're 3D printed allows the cost to be dropped quite a bit. Um, but there's still issues within fit and making sure that the prosthetist is making sure that this is the perfect device to wear on your body all day. Cause like the hand can be good all day, but if you can't keep this on your body for 12 hours at a time, what's yeah, the point of having it Wear it for an hour or two, like yeah. not worth it. And has the Vivionic right hand changed your life? What you have right now? The muscle so control? I actually have a different hand. You have right a different now. one? Okay. Yes, yeah, so that's relatively new. I haven't talked about it a ton on um, social media or anything like that because oh. I was testing it during the pandemic. And then I finally made the switch to this hand in the last few months. This is actually called the Kobe hand. Kobe. Uh, Kobe is the company. Um, and it's the Kobe Nexus. And it's a little bit um, more robust than the B Bionic hand. But in that, you can see the little screen. That's what my other hand didn't have. It lets you know like what grip pattern I'm in. Wow. Um, yeah. So what I'm showing on the screen right now is like there's a built-in little, um, it's not LED. It's um, the other one uh, that saves battery. I'm going to blank right now. Uh, but I promise I know about technology to anyone who's judging me. Um, <laughs> but there's a little screen that's OLED. It's OLED. That's what it's called. At least there's one because I'm so bad with technology. <laughs> well, I kind of have to. It's like, it literally is my body at this point, right? Yeah. Everyone jokes. They're like, oh, wow, you love tech. And I was like, I do. But I also kind of didn't get a choice, yeah. right? You're like, this is literally my body. And like, I had to know like milliamps of batteries and voltage and all these things because like, I'm going to do a little disassembly of my arm so I can show you all my pieces and parts right now. Okay. Um, so this is the hand, which is really cool. I actually wore this hand. Um, I had my B-Bionic hand, which is the hand that I had previous to this in an episode of Snowpiercer. Um, oh. I'm in, the season, I'm in the season two finale of Snowpiercer. And unfortunately not in season three because of COVID things. But, you know, I, I'm so excited to watch this <laughs> third season. But, uh, but yeah, so it's like a really cool design and they ended up making the other actress who is green screen, but she's a very lovely human. Um, <laughs> she, her hand looks very similar to the Kobe hand, which is really cool. But so how it works, it's all modular. So I can take my hand off and I have multiple hands so I can switch out my Kobe hand, my Nexus with the Be Bionic if I chose to. I also have, um, some activity devices. I'm like looking if any of them around me, but for, to do different things like working out and stuff mm. like that, um. Um, if I did want to wear a hook, they have the electronic hooks, the ETDs. It's a, uh, electric terminal device. And then I work with a company called All Ls that we do these really cool, uh, 3D printed covers, which wow. I think customization of devices is incredibly important, especially with kids. But when you think about like your hands, right? Mm. They look like your hands yeah. and like flesh colored stuff is important. And I believe that. And I believe it should exist for the people who want it, but also in thinking like, this is a stock model, right? Mm, there's okay. white, there's black, they have rose gold, there's three. And then you think about that and then everybody has the same one. So being able to customize the rest of everything, just like you would with your style, your outfit, your car, your room, like it's what makes you want to wear it, want to have it on, be proud of it, feel yeah. like it's yours. And I think psychologically that's very important with devices. <laughs> but yes, I love this one. This is I love the demonstration. And then this is all the, the inside my arm. You can see it's all see-through, right? So wow. I had a guy in the UK one time ask me if these were candy bars. I'm like, no, they're <laughs> batteries. Do not eat that. <laughs> wow. But uh, these are all flat cell batteries that are really, really cool. They're by a company called IBT. IBT. And that was like a huge thing that came out because the batteries used to be heavy mm -hmm. and thick and long. And Is that one your you favorite? About, is that one your favorite? My favorite arm? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, truthfully um my other frame is probably my favorite it's this silver oh. one created by arm dynamics and it has lights all laid into it oh, i just really didn't cool. charge that one last night um because they're separate chargers so like oh, wow. i'll have like all these arms laid out that i have to charge and like i always get comments online where they're like you can't use usb-c you can't have portable batteries and i'm like 
no, this isn't like your cell phone. Like, unfortunately, there are not as many people using these, Mm -hmm. like this mass market to make these technologies available to us as quickly as they're available to you. Mm. So when people are like, oh, this this tech has existed forever. And it's like, it'll trickle down to us eventually. Mm. But they're like, when you talk about amputees, Lower limb amputees are like 75% of the amputee population. If someone's an amputee, they're probably missing a leg, a foot, a toe. And then that other 25% is upper limb. Mm. And you start here, like the most common upper limb amputation is fingers. And then it gets to wrist and then it gets to arms. So when you think about what's available to people who are missing arms all the way up here, it's not a lot of stuff. Um, But we're getting there with with how quickly like... We're talking about how fast the acting world is moving. The tech world is also starting to ramp up too, where things are moving quicker, especially with 3D printing and being able to move faster now. So that's an exciting thing that uh, we're able to, to look forward to right now. I think one of the big things is like, this is, this is a small hand. That's what this is considered. So when you think about kids, like I grew up as a kid missing my arm and what was available to me was not this. Mm. Now the companies that do 3d printing, they're able to make a lot smaller hands. Now we still worry about the whole durability thing. And these are kids wearing them now. So they are a bit like rougher on them. But the fact that a kid, a young person gets to wear a multi-articulating hand, which is something I never got to do because it wasn't available to me is such an exciting thought. Like that they're able to have that, um, all those extra capabilities that, you know, wasn't available to them before. Um, and that's only happened in the last few years is really exciting to think like where we're going to be in the next three years, the next five years yeah. and, like with these people who respond to me online saying like, where are the USB-C batteries? Where are this? Those people are going to be the people that are bugging the big companies, Google, Amazon, Apple going like, why aren't you guys applying your tech to medical tech? Why aren't yeah. you, you know, they're going to make these big companies realize that when the people I always say this, the people that are not part of our population, right? The people without disabilities, when they start realizing and speaking up on behalf of us is when things are going to start to change. Mm. The people who are excited about tech, the people who are excited about prosthetic devices, and they go, you want to be a really great idea if they did this, this, and this with your hand? And I'm like, yes, keep saying that yeah. because they listen to lots of people. And like I said, our population now there's not a lot of amputees like there are a lot but they're also not a lot in comparison yeah, to in comparison the world to population. the world population yeah. Well, yeah so when we have people talking about it that don't necessarily need these devices but are demanding it for other people that's when all this change is going to happen that's when all the cool stuff that you have in your phone i'm going to get in my arm i'm not going to have to charge my arm every 12 hours i'm actually going to be able to go a week without charging my arm the idea of going a week without charging my arm and having my arm work for a week for me is just like mind blowing. Like that would be the coolest thing to me. And everyone's always shocked. Like, wait, you have to charge your arm every night? I'm like, yeah, to charge my arm every night. Sometimes, sometimes it doesn't even make it the whole day, depending on like how much I'm using it. Just like if you were like FaceTiming the whole day, right? Your phone would probably die faster. Yeah. Like, I'll have a busy day and my arm will just die. And I'm like, well, expensive paperweight for the next three hours until I can charge it. (laughs) And now we're there the topic of awareness. Um, I wanted to talk about your social media advocacy because one of the things that I love is that you actually educate people, which is something that people really need to. I mean, I'm learning so much from you today. Um, How did it all start? Like, did you just decide one day I'm going to use Instagram and I'm going to really start educating people about this topic? Mm -hmm. Um, I honestly think it's just been something that kind of came about really naturally. Mm. Um, My mom is a nurse and the way that I got my prosthesis is she had no idea I was going to be born with missing my hand. Mm -hmm. No idea, but she got put on bed rest two weeks before I was born and watched a program called um, My Electrics Make Children Whole. She saw the first My Electric Arms being brought into the U.S. for children. She cried through the whole thing. They're giving babies arms. That's so beautiful. Had no idea. Uh, Two weeks later, I was born and everyone cried, right? My dad's like, she's missing her arm. And my mom's like, saw it on the news, tiny robot arm. She's good. Like my mom had no concern in the world. Like we got this. (laughs) We got All the doctors thought she'd like lost it. Uh, Within the week we were at uh, the facility to get me a prosthesis. I became the youngest in the world to wear a myoelectric device at four months, 10 days. Like 
pretty much myelectric means that there's sensors inside the socket. And when you flex the muscles, it allows you to control the device. Mm. Back in the day, I only had one sensor. So it just went, I would flex it, it would open and then automatically close, wow. which led to a lot of ear pulling for my mom. Um, <laughs> but, but it got to this point where like my mom, like I was so, I was, you know, the youngest to do this mm. and there would be people losing limbs and, you know, the, our prosthetist would call me and be like, would call my mom and say like, can you show them how well Angel's doing? You know, when I was three, four or five. So I would go meet teenagers, adults, other kids and be like, yeah, I love my arm. Or like, I love that I have one arm. And, and I think my prosthesis is really cool. And I just kind of became this spokesperson without even realizing it, mm. like just telling my story to other people yeah, and showing that. Um, and then when I became an actress, it kind of got put a bit more into the forefront when I actually started like, you know, getting interviewed about things like that. And everyone was like, wow, you know, you know a lot about this. It was always interesting. It was always fun catching people realizing that like, I don't just wear it. I know a lot about yeah. it. Um, like prosthetists, even the people who fit these devices would want to tell me things. Um, and I'd be like, well, actually, and they'd be very surprised. I'm like, I've been doing this literally my entire life. Yeah. Um, and so... I always loved social media. Mm -hmm. I, you know, it was always fun for me. I, I think loving technology, you know, being very interested in things like coding and whatever, like the growing up that way. Um, yeah. What I, I think, think what I love about the, um, your social media advocacy is that you really um, have this message about self love and just confidence, which is something that I feel anyone needs. Like there's right. some days that we wake up and we, I'm going to curse. I'm going to, I feel, they, we feel like shit. <laughs> That's really yeah. it, right? <laughs> yeah. That's really it. We feel like shit. Yeah. And there then, is not another word for oh, it, you know? I look good today. Okay. I'm not that bad. You know, like it's like, it, I feel it's, it's a process of just mm -hmm. learning to love yourself and have confidence. So I wanted to know, like, what are your thoughts about it? And like, what tangible tips can you provide to anyone out there that might be struggling with self-confidence right now? Yeah, it's a really interesting thing because, like, I feel like we've been told for so long what we should look like, what we should be yeah. happy with, with our bodies, right? And we've had this kind of reinforced. That's why I think the media and representation is so important because yeah. when we start seeing diverse bodies, diverse looks, diverse everything and realizing, like, what you thought was normal is actually not normal. Those people all look a very specific way versus what's actually normal is for us all to be different and look different. And yeah. that's what's important. That's the important part of our society is that, you know, when you, even in science, right, the diversity of us is what makes us strong. Like we are not supposed to all be similar. That's, that's a weak society, right? If we all look the same <laughs> yes. way and exist in the same way, you're perpetuating the same traits. That's, mm. So I think our diversity, what makes us different. And I think that's been a big thing recently in the last few years that people have been embracing their uniqueness. Yeah. And I know we all wake up sometimes and we even talk about it. Like we all only know our own struggles and like yeah. you can look at somebody else who has a different type of life or a different kind of, you know, body and say like, well, they're positive, which is, which is good. But we all need to also know that we only know our own struggles. So like, yeah. if you are having a, a bad day, you can have a bad day. Yeah. I think that's an important thing to remember is like, sometimes we try to tell ourselves that we need to be happy in this every second of the day. And I think we really need to be able to sit with our feelings sometimes. And remember we talked about like, just to really think about why am I having this feeling? Who told mm. me I'm supposed to feel this way about my body? Yeah. And it's like, you know, when you think about it, I think a lot of the things that we're told are supposed to be the way we look yeah. are the way some people look. And it's like, there's, there's so many negative indications on so many words that were never meant to be bad words. You know, mm. it was just a word that we all of a sudden added this stigma to, you know? So when we talk about things about our bodies, like there's so many women who've taken back the word fat and said like, what is I'm fat? Like, that's okay. It's like, same thing with disability. Like, doesn't mean I'm unable it just is something a descriptor about myself. And I think there's so many things in this world that we're allowed to be proud of about ourselves that I think society has tried to tell us that are embarrassing or not okay or something we should change. And it's just like your body, especially during now with, with the pandemic and all those things has supported you and allowed you to live this life and do the things you need to do every day 
you know, and I think that we should remind ourselves that we should be proud and thankful for having that body and having, you know, that mind that's allowed us to still exist and to continue yeah. to exist and to be who we are and to, to be creative yeah. and all the positive aspects that we have to be inventive, to take, you know, there's so many people that have, have taken being at home or not able to do things out and taken the idea and, and ran with it and said, I've come up with this plan, this idea. And I think we need to reward and remind ourselves of the things that the positives that have come out of, you know, some of what we thought may yeah. have been a negative. It's so easy to focus on the negative, especially because of COVID. I think if anything, it's just hard to wake up and be thankful. That's like number mm -hmm. one. And second, try to be positive because we go through life and sometimes like just something triggers And then, oh my God, my whole day is ruined. You you can't have that right. mentality. Yeah, it's 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 hard. I think it's a work in progress every day, For right? For sure. And that's the thing. It's like nobody can expect to be perfect. We yeah. aren't. We are. We can't ever be perfect. And to hold yourself to that standard is setting yourself up to fail. Like yeah. some people say, like don't let it ruin your whole day. But sometimes it does. It does. <laughs> sometimes, it, right? Sometimes you have a bad day, and like stop beating yourself up about having a bad day. Something ruined your day. Okay. Yep. It ruins your day, but it's not going to ruin your week or your month yep. or your year. You know, like, like I said, you need to, we need to pay attention to what we were able to accomplish, whether maybe it did take a week, maybe it ruined your week, maybe it ruined your month. Honestly, I had a bad first few months of COVID. Like yeah. it was not, I, I didn't know what to do, but that doesn't mean that I'm, I'm going to go, wow, I should have learned a new skill. I should have started a this. Yeah. I should have, you still have to remind yourself of the things that you did do. And I think holding yourself, like, not, not, you're not holding yourself not accountable for, like, you know, doing bad things, but you didn't do anything wrong. Like, we're human. Yeah. Like, you never did wrong. Wrong is, the, is not the right word for that. Like, you didn't do anything wrong. You just have to continue moving. And I think that's an important thing that people with disabilities always, you know, kind of have this idea. It's like, things are hard. Things are always going to be hard because yeah. the world wasn't designed for us. So, you know, we can do hard stuff and we just keep going. And I think that is something that I would love non-disabled people to remember as well as like, you know, you just keep going. Like you're going to have roadblocks. You're going to have things get in your path. And like, that is something that we've had to do so often that like when you people ask me, how do you stay so positive? And it's like, you just keep moving. You yeah. just keep moving. And it's like, it's sometimes that's hard. And sometimes you want to take a day or a week or whatever and like yeah. do that. But like, Take that time and then keep moving. That must help you a lot with auditions because acting, it's, it's, it's tough. <laughs> You're so right. It's so funny. You were ready like, prepared like, 10 years ahead, right? When I first started auditioning, I used to like think about it constantly, right? You mm. get the audition and it says like films this week and does that. And it'll tell you like when things are supposed to happen. I would do an audition. I'd be like, still haven't heard back from so-and-so. And, and every couple of days I'd be thinking about it. I'd want to message my agent. Have we heard anything mm. now? I do an audition and I pretend it's done. I, it's I pretend done. that it never happened because there is no point dwelling on it. It doesn't yeah. change anything for me. I let myself keep moving. And if I get a call back, if I get another thing, then I could focus on it. Right. Yeah. Like I even like usually will have like, uh, I'll eat the same thing. I, I always get like poke after I have auditions. It's just one of those things where it's like, do the audition. Maybe even, maybe even this is what I say, like say all the things you want to say. I should have said this. I forgot to say that line. I wanted to make this choice. Let yourself think about it mm. and then be done. Yeah. Yes. I love that. You just have to focus <laughs> and take it one day at a time. That's really the key for anything. Um, if there's <laughs> one thing that you want um, people to take away from our conversation, what would that be? I think that there is something that to me right now is, is been on the forefront of with pandemic and like COVID and things starting to come back and maybe not come back depending on the area. But there have been so many things that have started to exist because of COVID, right? There's been people working from home. There's been um, Zoom calls. There's been all these accessibility things that have happened. And it has been such an amazing thing for disabled people because there's so many people with disabilities who, if you look at the unemployment rates, were unemployed because they were not able to get into buildings, were not able to work from home. And I think we're starting to dial back some of those things. And I think a really important thing to think about is when we're talking about dialing back a lot of these things, 
about the disabled people who are going to be forgotten about that were actually doing really well during the pandemic because mm. they were finally giving these given these accessibility measures. And maybe we need to advocate for those within companies because the unemployment rate of people with disabilities is huge and yeah. being able to work from home. And we've shown that it's possible. We've shown that the people are successful. Yeah. We've shown that all these things can happen. Um, and I would just love people to start speaking up, you know, whether it's when you hear ableist language, you hear someone make a joke that's not funny. Yeah. You know, if you're, if you're, you know, if someone's making a mocking tone, someone's using the R word, you're like, yeah. if your friend was there that had Down syndrome, if your friend was there that had a stutter, would you make that joke? Like, I think it's, we're getting to the point of now we, I think we need to start being accountable and we see, need to start, you know, if we care about people, our friends, even we want them to be their best people. So maybe we should just start, you know, being able to say what we need to say to them. And I hope that's something that, that holds up is this caring about society, caring about other people. I feel like that's something that we started paying a lot more attention to during the pandemic of going, you know, we need to care about other people. Um, not just ourselves. And I hope that that follows through into a lot of aspects. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I love that. Yeah, absolutely. I think a lot of people need to be reminded of that. So yeah, if you're listening to this, hold your friends accountable. Hold yourself your accountable. accountable. Yes. That's very, very important. <laughs> um, so we usually like to um, end the show with a fun round because we like to end things on a mm-hmm. lighter note. But I wanted to ask you my first real question first. What is the meaning of an abundant and meaningful life for you? Ooh, an abundant and meaningful life for me. I've always hoped that um, I can make a difference in someone else's life. Mm-hmm. So I think finding out that I've made some sort of change um, that is impactful to people. I think that would, that would check my box for meaningful mm. um, and make it feel like I, have, I, I'm able to do something that has an impact. Yeah. Um, abundant, I would say to me would mean being able to do those things where I, like the way that I said, like with the acting, like you feel like you can't not do it. Mm. I would be surrounded by the things and the people that I love. Um, whether that's acting, whether that's my partner, whether that's my friends, you know, I think those are all important things. Like that's an abundant life for me is being able to, to have those things that you just couldn't exist without. Oh, that's beautiful. (laughs) I love it. I was like, am am I too mushy? I'm always too mushy. I have a gooey center. apparently. So now to the fun round. Um, what is your spirit animal? Ooh. Um, do you have one? An animal that I get compared to a lot is, um, I, I grew up around ferrets. I don't know how familiar you are with ferrets, oh, but no. they're, they're, they're like kittens on caffeine. Like they're like really <laughs> silly and playful and they're like kind of awkward and bounce around a lot. Um, have a lot of energy and then sleep when they're awake, they're awake when there's, they sleep like 12 hours a day, which is also they do. Oh, wow. So- <laughs> Sleeping is always good though. Sleeping hey, is always you need to recharge. <laughs> Um, if you would not be doing like acting, what do you think what you would be doing right now? Uh, my dad wishes I was a lawyer, but I don't want to do that. I would probably be, um, a researcher psychologist doing stuff in social psych, uh, working with kids, um, Mm -hmm. probably juvenile amputees or clinical psychology. Um, but I, I really do love, um, policy aspect of disability Uh stuff. So I have gone back and forth with the amputee coalition, who's an organization that I love and work with a lot. Um, going to DC and campaigning for prosthetic coverage and laws. So like, I don't know, like maybe some type of policy stuff would be cool too. I love everything. That's the problem. I was like acting such a clear goal for me that if I didn't do acting, I'd be like, oh my gosh, there's so many things that I like. Yeah. <laughs> what are you obsessed with right now? Gudetama. Oh. It's a problem. I love Gudetama. <laughs> um, so if anyone likes Sanrio, it's like Hello Kitty. So Gudetama is this little lazy egg uh, with with the with the little butt, and they're great. They're my favorite thing. Um, I, I I never really was like a huge Hello Kitty person, but then I just saw this little cute fr- like fried egg. I was like, "Where's my mask?" I like I literally I have masks that are Gudetama. I have like a little stuffed animal in my car. I have way too much Gudetama stuff, and I've never been a person who gets like an obsession. So mm. like this has been like I'm like it's just so cute and I love it. <laughs> 
If you could go back in time when I went, you were a child, what would you tell the little angel? The thing about you that other people are uncomfortable with is one, their problem. Mm-hmm. And two, the thing that makes you so great. Um, love it. <laughs> Thank you so, so much, Thank Angel. You. Oh my God, I've learned so much from you. Keep doing the amazing work you're doing. You're going to conquer Hollywood. Yes. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. It's always <laughs> great to have people, you know, yeah. uh, elevate voices, especially disabled yes. voices, and especially this month during Disability Pride Month, which is really exciting. We need more role yeah. models. Like it. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Thank you so much. Um, good luck with everything. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. That is all for today. Thank you so much for tuning in. Don't forget to subscribe to our podcast. We have an incredible lineup of guests, so you're not going to want to miss any of our episodes. Also, connect with us on Instagram and join our Facebook group at My Voice Your Story for more tips on how to live your best life.